Well, this morning we got a special treat in the house, um, and I'm going to introduce Pastor Kevin and Susan Fletcher. They, uh, they're my spiritual parents. Um, but I wanted to just introduce them this way because it's so easy to grow accustomed to people that you've grown up with. Um, the Bible says that, moreover, it is required, and I make fun of Pastor Kevin here on this, for a steward, um, uh, he, he says that kind of funny, but uh, for a, moreover, it is required that a steward be found faithful. And so if you know the parable of the talents or anything about that, it's that, that he gave one, one talent, another two, another one five, each according to, you know, what they could handle, according to their faithfulness, right? Well, this morning, ministering to you, there's a couple that has been faithful in the ministry for 40 years. Forty years of not quitting. Forty years of loving. Forty years of we're going to believe God. Forty years of saying yes to the direction of the Lord. And you cannot be faithful unless you continue to do what God has asked. Faithful is simply saying yes to the direction of the Lord no matter what it costs. No matter what it costs. And so they're here from, from England because they said yes to the Lord. They got grandkids here and all that. It'd be easy to stay. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to and that I can't believe at this time in their life they would move and leave their family. They didn't finish that sentence follow God. So that's the vessel that you get to hear from this morning. That's a treasure. That's, um, I would say, great capacity. Great capacity to pour in. And so, um, Pastor Kevin Susan, just want to come. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. What an honor and a privilege to be here. Are you happy to be here? Isn't it amazing what God is doing? How many of you can say or have a testimony that God has been good to you in your life? Yes. Isn't he faithful? Yes. Can you lift your hands one more time and just worship him this morning for just being good? Thank you, faithful. Father. Father, you're so faithful. And we're gathered together here to worship you. And just to tell you and to show you how much we love you and value you, your presence in our lives. Your presence is everything. Your presence is something that we hunger for. Your presence is a necessity. Your presence is vital to our lives. It's vital to our capacity to keep saying yes and to serve you with everything that is within us. It's your presence. It's the reality of who you are. And in this season, Father, we, we want and we pray, as Kevin and I are here today, we pray that your presence and the reality of who you are will be greater than anything this people has known before. And that as they go into this this new year, there will be a renewed and a deeper awareness of your presence, of your voice, of your direction into all the things, the good works that you've called them to in 2020. And we declare with faith and confidence they'll do everything you've predetermined that they will do. They will keep every appointment. They will speak every word. 
They will walk through every door you open. They will be your voice, your hands, your feet, and they will minister Jesus. of your presence, weighty, full of everything good, heavy, your hand upon this people, heavy, miraculous, healing power, saturated. with your presence, carrying your presence into their everyday lives. Full of you. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thanks, God. Anyways, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to sit down now. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I will, too. <laughs> Anyway, I, I was just, as I was sitting there this morning, I was thinking how, you know, what we celebrate at Christmas, we really celebrate Jesus saying, yes. Amen. Yes. I mean, he's there with the Father, and the Father says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to become a gift to all mankind. Will you do that? And he said, yes. I'll do that. You know, I... Um, I was also thinking that was the beginning of really where we are right now. What Jesus did, we know he came, a little baby, he grew up, he gave his life. So we can be reconnected, reunited, we can be in fellowship now with God again, completely open between God and ourselves. And not only that, but Jesus said, I'm going to start something brand new here that's never existed before. It's called the church. Now we know there's the universal church of everyone that's born again, but there's also each local church. Each local church, which, which is something we can see. As humans, we can see that. We can't see the universal body of Christ, but we can see every local church. And this, this promise has just been going off in me, Matthew 16, 18. Because, you know, if you watch the news at all, it seems like the church is going down and evil's coming up. But in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. I will build it. And the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. Now, evil is on the rise. We can see that, can't we? But guess what? I um, hate to tell you this, but that's a promise in the Word too. Because it says in the end, it's going to get bad. But just as bad as it gets, the church rises up. The church is rising up. I'm telling you, there are some incredible things happening around the world. Do you know, I may have mentioned this to, to some of you, do you know where right now the church, as far as people being born again, is, is uh, happening the fastest? What nation of the world do you think that is? No? Iran. Iran. I mean, there is major numbers of people being saved in Iran, and there are no real churches as like this where you can gather together and meet. It's all happening in homes, and you know who is kind of leading that? Women. Boy, that shoots a few things, uh, you know, kind of. But I'm telling you, God is doing some incredible, incredible things. But it all started when Jesus said yes. He said yes. And this morning as we were worshiping, couldn't you feel just that presence of God? Just like you just, you, you want to say, I just want to stay right here. Let's just stay right here for a couple hours and then we'll leave. <laughs> Have you been in a church service where you don't feel the presence of God? <laughs> Yeah, we've all, we've all 
been there. And you know, I know when, uh, and even to this day, and I'm sure Pastor Nate's the same way, who's the first person you ask about how the message was? Yep. <laughs> how was it? How was it? You know, and sometimes you feel like, yeah, I really, I really got that connection. It was like, and then sometimes you're like, oh, you just want to crawl in a hole somewhere. You know what I mean. <laughs> But you know what I've always had happen is usually when you think you haven't just quite hit it, you haven't made that connection, you almost think that anyone even get ministered to, someone will come up and go, you know, there was this thing you said, this scripture you gave, or this point you made, wow, I mean that really just spoke something to me, and, and you think, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> But we're going to look this morning at this awesome promise that God gave us. He gave us this awesome promise. Matthew chapter 1 verse 23. And I think it's, it's, you know, obviously during this Christmas season we're celebrating the birth of Jesus. But there's a promise there. In Matthew 1 23 in the New Living Translation, it says, Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. What a concept. Man had been separated from God, but now God's saying, that time's over. God is with us. What a concept. I I have to, you know, Trent's here. I have to mention a little something from when Trent was a little boy. What was that song, Susan? Amy Grant. Yeah, Amy Grant's song, Emmanuel. Well, Trent, he was just singing that song out, you know, putting, giving it everything he's got when he was a little boy, except the words came out a little different. It wasn't Emmanuel, God with us. It was Emmanuel, Bubba Gus. <laughs> so the budding songwriter there had made up a new song. But God says, I'm giving a gift to the world on this day. I'm giving my son. I'm giving my son. So now, Emmanuel, God with us, we can make that personal. We can say, God with me. Yes, he's with us, but he's with me. It's personal. And the wonderful thing about this in Hebrews 13, 5 God said this, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you, ever. Even we do all these horrible things, bad things. We think God's deserted us. God has never left you. And he never will. He never will. So then we we have to say, well, how come sometimes I I just don't feel his presence? Why don't I feel his presence? If he never leaves us, if he never forsakes us, how come I seem, it seems like God's so far away, I can't even see him, I can't even feel him. So God says, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. I never will. And if God says it, the word says God's not a man that he could lie. So he isn't lying. So we have to say, all right, God's saying I'm never leaving you or forsaking you. Then why is it we don't sense him? I think we have to check ourselves, don't we? We don't have to to look at God and say, God, why aren't you here? He is there. Or where have you gone, God? Or why don't I feel close to you? We have to then turn and say, okay, okay. Why am I not feeling like he's close to me? You know, in the word of God, I mean, we call this time of year the the Christmas season, right? And we can see throughout the word, God always works in seasons. There's seasons, there's different seasons. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 says, For everything there is a season. A time for every activity under heaven. 
And again, we call this the Christmas season. There are certain activities that go along with that season. Now, it seems like the last number of years when, when we've been back, and so all of us as a family will go to the latest Star Wars movie. So last night we went to the latest Star Wars movie, and Jess is our family uh, Star Wars expert, so we get a briefing, or we try to, okay, who's this, who's that, what's going on, and she can answer all those questions, so we can kind of get up to speed. So we go to this movie last night, and I have to say, it was different at the end. The movie was great. The people in the movie, it was different. It was different. There was someone dressed in a Chewbacca onesie. And then this guy started running around after the movie in a black cape. And he's running by us. And, he's, and then Susan said, what was the lady doing down? Uh... Yeah, she's, she has her eyes closed. In the end of the movie, it's going da-da-da. And she's singing along with it and doing all this. And I thought, I don't, maybe they're worshiping at the altar of Star Wars or something. I don't know. <laughs> but it, we, had, we, we were really laughing hard at this. But, you know, that's one of the activities we like to do is all go to a movie together and go out to eat and have fun. I mean, gosh, how many of you have eaten too much already? Yeah, Susan and I bought like the jumbo, gigantic, uh, crazy size bag of peanut M&Ms last <laughs> night. I mean, this thing was, it was like this tall. Yeah. <laughs> and we started eating those and pretty soon, it's, it, you know, it seemed like there was, it wasn't, we weren't making any progress. Either that or those things were reproducing inside the bag or something. I don't know. But... <laughs> We were eating those, and this morning Susan goes, I never want to see another peanut M&M in my life. <laughs> and uh, actually, before we had, had left to come over, we're driving along in our car, and we've got the Christmas music, you know, turned on. And finally I said, Susan, I like Christmas music, but can we listen to something else for just a little bit here? You know, so these are all things that are part of the Christmas season, aren't they? Shopping. Have you finished your shopping? All the guys are going, no. <laughs> but this is all part of what we do. And it's also a very busy time of year, isn't it? Super busy. I mean, stuff going on. But we always have to remember, again, we're celebrating the birth of a king. If someone invites you to a birthday party, would it be kind of rude to, you know come to the birthday party and never acknowledge the person's whose birthday it is? Yeah. You know, God's not a control freak. He is not a control freak. He's waiting for us to make the move to get close to Him. You know, have you ever noticed when you get really, really busy in life, I mean, maybe it's you're working extra or things with the family or, you know, there's always sports with the kids and hunting and all these things that are great, wonderful activities. But when we get really busy, what's usually the first thing to go? Our time in the Word, our time in prayer, our time with God. You know, it's always much easier to hear someone's voice the closer you are to them. It's also easier to hear someone's voice when you can give them your undivided attention. Especially for guys. <laughs> guys, we seem to focus in on something and our common response when our wife says something is, yep, yeah, and we have no idea what we're saying yes to. But see, God is saying, I want you for my own. I want you to give me your attention, undivided attention. And the wonderful thing about God is he loves us so much, he wants to be around us. He's like, I want to I be around you. I want to be close to you. He's giving us his attention but if we 
don't give him our attention, that's when we won't even sense that he's there. We won't even sense that he's there. He wants us to seek him. He wants us to pursue him. He wants us to crave his presence. Like Susan craved peanut M&M's. <laughs> oh, was my idea? No, 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 no. Let's correct this. I think, you remember when we pulled up to Walgreens, right? Matthew and I, yeah, I'm just getting my, you know, back up here. Susan said, can you buy some peanut M&M's when you're in there for the movie? I just happened to buy the biggest bag they had. <laughs> so I just wanted to bless you, honey. Just bless you. <laughs> but everything we, everything we need is all wrapped up in his presence. It's all right there. So what I want to do is just take a few minutes and look back at the Christmas story and really kind of the main characters that were part of that story and see what their responses were to the presence of God. What did they do? You know, first, first people to look at is the wise men. The wise men. And we're not going to turn to the scripture. I think we all probably know the basic story about this. But it's in Matthew chapter 2, the beginning of the chapter there. But we know that Jesus was born, it says in Bethlehem. It was during the reign of not a great king, King Herod. It says about that time, some wise men came from the east. They came to Jerusalem and they asked a question. They said, where's, where's this newborn king? And they said, we saw his star as it rose and we came to worship him. So the star was pointing to where Jesus was. So King Herod hears about this, and he's ticked off. He's mad. So he calls a meeting. It says he calls a meeting of the leading priests and the teachers, and he asks, where's this Messiah? Where's he going to be born? And they said, well, it's, this is scriptural. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. That's what the Word of God said. Because that's what the prophet wrote. And they say how... They, they read the scripture, the Old Testament scripture, and this, they say, this is going to be a ruler. He's going to be a king. Well, that makes King Herod mad. Because King Herod says, hey, I'm on the throne. No one else is going to take my place on this throne. So he talks to the wise men, and they obviously see the star, and then it says they come to worship him. Now we get in mind that here's this little baby in a manger, but actually by the, by the time this happened, he would have probably been about two years old. So what do two-year-olds do? They're running around and doing fun things. So imagine this, they come in, they come in with their treasure chests, and what do they do? Give him what at that time was a bunch of money. Gold, frankincense, myrrh. And then they returned, it says, to, their other, to, to where they came from, but they went a different route because God warned them in a dream not to go back to Herod. So they came to see Jesus in his home. They gave him all these gifts. And they wouldn't give up. They would not give up because this wasn't just, oh, Let's just drive across town here. This was a two-year journey for them to get there. That's how much they were seeking and searching and wanted the presence of God in their life. Two years they journeyed. So let's look back at Herod. What was Herod looking for? I think we probably all know what Herod did. He basically slaughtered a bunch of babies, young boys, to try and kill his competitor. So Herod wasn't looking for Jesus because he wanted to worship him. He was trying to wipe out the competition. Why? Because he said, I'm on the throne of my life. It's all about me. No one's going to take that place, not even God himself. Not even God himself. 
And I think we can see parallels in this with people today. You know, many times people will say, no, I'm not going to do that God thing. I'm going to do it my way. It's all about me. So on that night, we see then Jesus, or, um, excuse me, Mary and Joseph. Mary's pregnant. She's about to have the baby. They are trying to find a place to stay. So where do they go? Where's the first place they go? They go to an inn. Knock on the door. And what did the innkeeper say? No room here. No, no room here. So the innkeeper's confronted with the presence of God. And what does he say? No room in my life for that. I'm busy with all these other things. No room. No room at all. I'm too busy right now. You know, I think, I think busyness is probably one of the main things that will keep us from sensing the presence of God. We get so busy, busy, busy with this and that. You know, I think we, we see a good uh, uh, example of this with Mary and Martha. So, you know, Jesus and the disciples, they're coming to Jerusalem and they come to this village. It says, Martha welcomed him into her home. This is in Luke chapter 10. And it says, Mary did what? She sat at the Lord's feet. She recognized, here's the presence of God right here. I'm, I'm going to sit at his feet. But what was Martha? It says, Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. Now, Martha was doing what she thought was right. And then she comes to Jesus and says, Lord, it's not fair that my sister just sits here while I do all the work. You need, to, you need to tell her to come and help me. And what did Jesus say? He says, I'll put it in my words. You're worried about things that don't matter. Eternally, they don't matter. Not a bit. These things don't matter. You're worried and upset over all these things and you're missing the point. You're missing the point. You need to spend time in my presence. I don't care about the dinner and all this. I just want you to spend time in my presence. So what Martha was doing was a good thing, obviously, but it wasn't the best thing. It wasn't the best thing. You know, I, I think if the back door opened and Jesus came walking in and took a seat, I think we would all recognize, and we could say, the presence of God is here, right? But if we get so distracted with all the other things, we can miss that presence. We can completely miss it. And what about the shepherds that night? What did they do? What was their reaction? So they're out there guarding their sheep, watching the flocks. And then all of a sudden, this angel of the Lord appears. Now, that would freak you out anyway, right? You're out there in the middle of the night, hear the little sheep out there, and all of a sudden, here's this angel. And he starts talking. It says, the angel of the Lord appeared among them. The radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. So imagine the glory of God is just totally surrounding you. You're looking at this angel. And the first thing the angel says is what? Yeah, don't be afraid. What? <laughs> but then he tells them about this baby that's been born. And then it wasn't just one angel. It was this whole multitude, it says, of the armies of heaven. Imagine that, the angel with all the armies of heaven. And they're doing what? They're praising God. Now, I think you would recognize, yeah, God is doing something here. I'm feeling a little something here. The presence of God. And they're singing, glory to God in the highest heaven, peace on earth to those, whom, with, to those with whom God is pleased. So then the angels, all that leaves. And what's the first thing the shepherds say? We got to go. 
we got to go see what this is all about. Let's see this thing. They hurry to that village. They find Mary, Joseph, the baby's there lying in the manger. And what's the first thing they did? They see the baby. They see Jesus. They know this is real. I felt the presence of God. I saw the angels. This is what they said. What's the first thing then they have to do? Go tell other people. Jesus has impacted my life. That's what they're saying. I've seen it. I believe it. I know it. Now I have to go tell someone. I have to share this incredible news and this story. So not only were they searching for the presence, they couldn't wait to tell someone else about it. They had to go tell. So I guess the question we have to answer today is what's our response going to be to his presence? Are we going to allow him to be on the throne of our life? Are we going to say, well, yeah, you know, Jesus, I'll let you be on the throne in this area, but not in this one. You're going to have to step down for this one because I want to be on the throne in this area of my life. You know, Mary, or excuse me, Martha, the innkeeper, they weren't really even conscious of his presence. We don't want to be like that, obviously. But more like the wise men who are going to continue, 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 no matter what it takes to seek out his presence. There's a couple of scriptures I want to read here, and then I want to challenge you a bit. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and 8, gives us some instruction about what we need to do. And this is the New Living Translation. It says, keep on asking and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking, knocking, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks the door will be opened, will be. Now I looked up the, the, the Greek, you know, I'm not a Greek scholar or anything, but I looked that up, that word will, and you know what it means? Will. <laughs> so it will be, if we knock, the door will be opened, will be. If you never knock, the door won't be open. So it says we have to keep on knocking, keep on knocking. And then in Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, we're going to talk about another door here. And this is the door where Jesus is saying, look, I stand at the door and knock. So in the first one, we're knocking on the door, aren't we? We're knocking. Who's inside? Jesus. We're knocking. And what does he do? Opens the door. Come on in. Revelation 3.20, Jesus is standing out there and he's knocking on our door. So this is a two-way thing, isn't it? We're knocking on his door. He's knocking on our door. And so in verse 20, it says, look, I stand at the door and knock. What do we always use that scripture for? We talk about, and, and rightly so, we use it and say, you know, Jesus is standing there. He's knocking on the door of your heart, and he desires to come in. We use it to tell people about uh, being born again. He says, look, I stand at the door and knock, but do you know who this was written to if you look in the context this was written to those seven churches in Revelation. This is written to the church. So Jesus is saying, I'm standing here knocking, knocking. He's knocking on the believer's heart. He's saying, I'm standing out here, I'm knocking. If you hear my voice, if you hear my voice, the word says we do hear his voice, don't we? Unless we're not paying attention. If you hear my voice and open the door, so who has to open the door? We do. Jesus doesn't force his way. 
He's not going to, you know, break down the door. He's waiting for us to open it up. He says, I'll come in and we will share a meal together as friends. You know, isn't it wonderful when you get together with friends and, and share a meal together? I mean, there's a closeness that's developed there, isn't there? It's just so much fun and so enjoyable, and you get, you get uh, closer that way. So we see two different things here. We have to knock. We have to take the initiative. And then when Jesus is knocking, it's all about us doing that as well, opening that door. And just saying, God, I... Jesus, I want, I desire so much your presence. But it takes effort on our part. It doesn't just happen. Have you noticed that, that things with God don't just happen? God has done what he's going to do. He's taken that step towards us. Now we have to take that step towards him. We have to take that step. You know, in this time of the year, as it gets so, so, so busy. And then as we're moving into this next year, God wants to do some wonderful, wonderful, incredible things in all of our lives. But it's going to take a recognition of His presence. His presence. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Now, maybe you're, uh, those, those examples that I gave, maybe you're looking at that and saying, I know Jesus is on the throne of my life. Is he on, and I would ask this question, is he on the throne of your whole life? Or have you held back parts and say, no, this is my part of my life. You can have all the rest, but not this part. Or maybe you've gotten so busy that you're not really sensing and feeling his presence. Or maybe you're just saying, you know, I just want more of your presence. I know I sense the presence of God, but I just crave and hunger after more. And so what I want to do is, is uh, well, let me not forget this. Maybe you've never really sensed that presence of God. Maybe you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. So for all these different things I've mentioned, we, we just want to spend some time worshiping the Lord, but also just have the altar here where you can come. For any of these things that we talked about, maybe there's areas of your life you just need to come and, and just get before God. And I will give you a guarantee. If you make that step toward God, He's right there for you. And you will sense that presence. You will sense that love. You'll sense that peace. You'll sense that joy that He provides abundantly. So as we uh, spend a few minutes worshiping the Lord, don't be embarrassed just to come. Just come. And just get before God. Tune out all these other things that are going on maybe thinking about, well, I have to do this or that or the other. And just take these few minutes. Just take these few minutes and open that door to what Jesus wants to do, what God wants to do in your life this morning.